and welcome. We are here today to talk about the current situation regarding Palestine and the, I mean, the regarding the, the, the English, the conclusive nature of which is that hands must be taken off, is, uh, sorry, off Palestine. Israel's hands must be taken off Palestine. Mm. I'd like to thank you for the video you streamed yesterday, you know, showing the demonstration that I recorded on video at the uh, Basaria village, you know, where the military stopped us from walking on the highway, you know, in the peaceful demonstration. Later on in that video, I ended up getting hit by a rubber bullet in the shin. So that was uh, incredible, you know, surreal. You know, I didn't think, you know, that anything like that could happen. I was taking too many risks, actually, you know, you can see in the video. Just you, you know, right up front. They got really pissed off about it as well. Yeah. yeah. It was it was yeah. a it was a very visceral thing to watch. I mean, uh, 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 you know, peaceful demonstration goes down, and they bring in. Well, I mean, the the twenty four military soldiers came in the same beat. They all came together. That was their mm. that was their initial response after the police. The police were small compared to that, uh, and you know it ended up swarming up to the point where there must have been at least eighty or, or ninety men then there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, like a land day is you know a big issue there, and usually on land day they kill somebody. You know, it's like ritual oh, with them. That geezer that they had around the back of the truck that they were beating the shit out of as well, getting him out of the sight of the press. And then when one yeah, of the press yeah, guys yeah. from the Palestinian state press That's got right. around the side, they, they started trying to throttle yeah. him as well. Yeah, but I got it through the window. You got a lot of their faces as well. Yeah, that's what I do, you know. <laughs> one day, you know, they're going to be indicted. <laughs> and oh, they know yeah. it. Every... That's why they came after me, you know, they like, can try to stop me from videoing. But I mean, you see them as well. They 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 all think they're some next action man, tough guy thing. They all put on this jutted exterior with this straight face, not show any emotion, anything. Yeah. Um, you, except you, the couple old, of them that are actually showing joy in their faces because they're evil little bastards. Yeah. Well, you know, like <clears throat> the one guy that was the most antagonistic, I think he was Druze. He was speaking Arabic, you know, with the Palestinian, and they are like mercenaries, you know, for the Zionist state. And, and the Israeli you at one point as well to, to gas grenade you. They baited a conversation out of them, and then they yeah. argued with them for, for a few minutes. So people would all gather around and have a look, and then moved off. And five gas grenades just come calling yeah, across yeah. the ground. Yeah, but if you notice, it wasn't the Druze officer who ordered the gas grenades. It was the um, Israeli Ashkenazi officer who came, you know, with the lapels in sort of a lighter material, and you know that was the officer, and he ordered, you know, the gas grenades, you know, because people weren't dispersing fast enough. Yeah. even though, you know, they were only ordering people in Hebrew. So, you know, like, why would demonstrators pay attention to that? <laughs> they don't know what the fuck the people are saying, how they're supposed to understand. Uh, a lot of them do know it, you know, because they've worked, you know, with uh, in, in Israel, you know, like 160,000 Palestinians go into Israel, 67, you know, 48 Israel every day to work, you know, yeah. or lesser wages, of course. But yeah. Uh, you know, like if they wanted to do, uh, you know, mess up the scene there, you know, they could do so very easily, you know, but they don't. <laughs> so, you know, like this big brouhaha about, you know, terrorism and all that sort of thing is uh, something that's uh, mostly a result of provocations, you know, and not the regular course of events, not the general state of the consciousness of the Palestinians, you know. They don't want to bother with that sort of, you know, nonsense anyway. You know, it doesn't get them. It anywhere might have anyway. into more of a bloodbath if the Palestinian state press wasn't live videoing, because I imagine their feed would have been live given their state. Yeah, there were a lot of Palestinian uh, journalists there. Yeah, sometimes there's international journalists as well, like from China even. You know that I've met. Well, you know, you know, not uh, from China directly. You know, but uh, you know, a commission by China to report. You know, for their news agencies as well. Now, Iran, though, I don't think they get into any reporting there. <laughs> Not uh, Russia today either. You know, some other sort of, you know, minor sort of, you know, news medias can get through. Yeah, it's, um, it all depends on how their, their scope and their aim and, um, 
what yeah. kind of relationship the nation of which you come from has to Israel as well. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. You yeah. under the net to yeah. well, the US, Canada, Britain, and China. Oh, no, no, no Western media at all. No Western media wants, you know, to come in there and report on the Palestinian no, They don't want to come there, but they get an advantage of being able for, for people who come from these nations can slip in if they wanted to to, to actually report there. Because um, there's, there's, there's a... Um, Places like from these nations is where uh, the guards less up. Um, media pieces that criticize the U.S. block are going to be less invited. So nations that are against the imperialist block of the U.S. end up being a little more contentious. Yeah, no, they don't get in. No. Maybe some European uh, news agencies will go through. Yeah. But uh, it's a Palestinian so, struggle that's isolated and silenced, just like the Yemeni struggle is. Yeah. Mm. But uh, the Palestinians are organized. You know, we worked in a uh, United Front coalition called the um, Popular Resistance Committees. All the committees, you know, like were autonomous and they could come in on an action if they wanted to, and they would all contact each other, and everybody would be able to, you know, report it or not, you know, depending on their circumstances. We go out and have common demonstrations like the one that we did in Jordan Valley when I walked with uh, everybody else. And then we got picked up as, as we were leaving the demonstration and uh, got put into military detention for 26 hours, blindfolded, hands uh, tied with uh, plastic uh, ties, no, mostly no food and no sleep, you know, like the soldiers, you know, coming down to uh, mouth off in Hebrew all night long. Until they got curious with me and they were asking me, you know, I wrote an article about this, <clears throat> more like a theatrical piece, in which the soldier asked me, you know, like, are you Jewish? Yes. Uh -huh. So uh, don't you want to live in Israel? And I said, no, I want to live in Palestine. <laughs> 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 so he had nothing to say, you know, like, and I was so pissed off with them, I didn't want to talk anymore, you know, but they sort of uh, let me talk a bit, even though we were ordered not to talk, you know, it was, it was not allowed. It was like martial law inside this little sort of, you know, like detention cube, concrete oh, no. cube, you know, <clears throat> with a metal door that's slammed every time the soldiers went in or out, usually leaving the door open to let the cool night air in so that we would freeze. And uh, any way to make people feel absolutely uh, diabolically uncomfortable. Yeah, it's called clean torture, you know, trying to convince people, you know, that you should be afraid and not to do it again. But, you know, we're used to that. Two uh, internationals, uh, two women from France and Spain, five Palestinians and myself. And uh, then the police, you know, questioned us in the morning as to uh, what, the per what the reason was that we were detained and they found that there was no reason. So they just let us go and they dumped us on the side of the highway and that was it. We were, we were out, minus all the video files that I had made, <laughs> of course. They had just uh, deleted everything on the camera. At least they got the camera back. My, 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 my. Yeah, but, uh, as it did just smash the fucking thing and say, oh, we dropped it. Ooh, uh, uh, there are limitations, you know, like one time I was detained, you know, while helping to plant on a friend's land, you know, next to a Zionist colony on the top of the mountain. And, uh, you know, we got pulled in and the soldier uh, was talking to me while I was waiting for my camera. I refused to leave until I got my camera back. And the soldier looks at me, you know, holding his gun, his rifle, you know, M16. He says, you know, I could shoot you, he says to me. So I said, uh, as he's playing, you know, with uh, the control on his, on his uh, M16. So I said, no, you can't, you know, because, you know, there's... Uh, Azaria, you know, the soldier, you know, who killed Palestinian who was uh, lying, you know, bleeding out on the on the on the street. And uh, because he, he shot him, you know, and killed him right away, he got put into prison for three years. So, you know, Palestinian life at maximum is worth three years imprisonment. And so I said to the guy, you know, like, no, you know, like if you shot me, you know, then you would be put in prison. So he didn't say anything in return. He knew it was true, you know, because, you know, here I am. Second generation Holocaust survivor shot by an Israeli soldier, you know, like, He's gonna get a lot I was years. <laughs>
Yeah. So. Yeah, that would you know, not I, go I, down I well with the community at all because Israel yeah, has the image uh, to keep up. It has to make a yeah, demonstration yeah, yeah. out of it. Yeah, it that's their weakness. Into. Yeah, the weakness, you know, of Zionism is all the lies it's told. <clears throat> all the young Jewish Americans are growing up, you know, going to university and finding out, you know, that they've been lied to and they don't like it. So they're losing the young generation. 25% overall of all the Jewish Americans uh, now consider Israel to be an apartheid state. Right? That means that they're anti-Zionist. 25%. Yeah. And we've only gotten started. <laughs> so, you know, we can clean up this uh, Zionist uh, takeover of the Jewish people. You know, much like I think the, uh, the Nazis have taken over the leadership, you know, of the Ukrainian national struggle, which is legitimate, you know, as far as I'm concerned. Legitima legitimate for Lenin as well. But it's been taken over and funded by uh, not so much Europe, you know, the United States more so, but, you know, Eastern Europe, you know, countries like Poland. The UK had a big hand in this as well, to be fair. Oh, yes, they UK. They held but battalion. Yeah, but the UK is not in Europe anymore. <laughs> it's off there. Oh, well, that's what we keep telling everyone, but we, we, we forgot that geography is a thing here. Yeah, we'll realize eventually. <laughs> um but no, yeah. I, there's actually, so there's a lot of suspicions that might suggest that the UK may have set the whole Russiagate and Ukraine war situation up. Like, well, they, but so here's the thing. The US and the EU are still like 50-50 in their governments as to whether we, should we go to war or not? <laughs> the UK, over a month ago now, already yeah. said yes like, they, they, <laughs> as soon as russia went into fucking ukraine the yeah, they were the, 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 the uk had a parliament session like the next day hey. <laughs> like, as if that's we need to go it. to war do you know what the only there was one question that basically groups up all the questions that was asked of the prime minister in parliament that day and it was prime minister could you please make sure that you protect the ukrainian people against vladimir putin <laughs> Oh yes, just <laughs> everyone is split, but the UK is one hundred percent, and that is suspicious because uh, the UK is not ready to fight a war. Right uh, so the Labour Party supporting the Conservatives now on on this war drive. Labour supporting Conservatives. Yeah, the only difference between them is that Labour wants to get close to China at the moment, which is interesting. Uh huh. Uh, well, they want to ride yeah. the lightning, so it be. Uh, yeah, here people are competing to. Express our solidarity with Ukraine. But nobody was talking about Donbass, Donetsk, Lugansk. Nothing, nothing, no word about that at all. Yeah, incredible. But that's what it's all about. I don't know if Russia made a tactical error or strategic error in pushing in from the Western Ukraine to such an extent that they're now retreating unnecessarily so. Uh, you know, and their retreat demonstrates that they unnecessarily advance on that front when they should have been in Donbass, helping out the local militias to kick out the Nazis. So at least they're doing that now. I think it's what what the problem is is rather than helping deal with Nazis in the Donbass and the Donna and in the Luhansk. Sorry, um, I'm too used to saying Donetsk because that's the British version of Donbass. Um, uh. Because we give it a different name because English. <laughs> we, we always do it everywhere we go. We're terrible. <laughs> but the um, uh, 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 Donbass and Luhansk, um, I, I feel that like the class contradictions of Russian society drove an imperialistic war instead due to their opportunism. And so they were too focused on pushing forward and not actually dealing with the issue of Nazism. And I mean, there's there's a picture from the that I I actually showed on one of my streams of a guy from the uh, uh, the Donbass People's Republic getting a medal from the leader and he actually has two Nazi symbols on his patches. He has mm. the skull, the the one for the SS, mm. and then he has um this Nordic symbol that that's commonly used by fascists. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So there's fascists on both sides. It's a bit unfortunate. 
And well, what, what is really I... unfortunate is that this problem seems to have been something that they sort of just let happen because there were some really decent people at the start of this. Like when when they first split in twenty fourteen. Uh, a lot of communists were involved in this, and a lot of those communists are now dead. No, the communists and anarchists are supporting Ukraine there. Yeah, who, in Ukraine, they've they've uh, they've been swept up, you know, by this whole, you know, na nationalist hysteria. I think, but uh, you know, I think that Russia is taking this big risk because the prize is big, also, you know, because Oil. the Donbas region, you know, both. Uh, uh, and Donetsk and Lugansk uh, are uh, resource rich and have, you know, all the industrial infrastructure of the Ukraine, steel plants and stuff like that. So, you know, like Putin is willing to defend their, you know, right to self-determination because, you know, it pays off for Russia because, because, they're, they're right. because he's going to disrespect their right to self-determination as it suits him. As well no, as he'll, he'll, he'll respect it, you know, he'll give them a good deal, you know, like he, they're, you know, like in no, in no position to argue, you know, to, to, to the barter. Such thing is a good deal in an, imperial com in an imperialist relationship, and Russia is an imperialist power. Yes, so but it but would be, it'd be that, better than what the U.S. would offer them, but it's, it's yeah, pennies and pounds. I mean, but though they're they'll probably be willing to play pay for world price, you know, for the resources in the Ukraine. You know, it's not going to be like super exploitation. It's going to be alignment, you know, it's a more a geopolitical strategy than economic uh, imperialism because, you know, there's no Russian corporations that are going into the region there to take over the economy. I think it's the local economy is going to be remain uh, autonomous or independent from Russia. They're just going to be supplying Russia with resources. But with the way that finance capital operates, the corporations don't even need to extend themselves into the third world. They just need oh, yeah, to finance overpower capital. and control the corporations that exist within that nation. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be, yeah, the and telling point I mean, is going how to be... How many of the corporations in Ukraine that exist are already related to Russia or not is also a questionable situation. I mean, think about, like, because think about how long-standing old colonial relationships go. Think about Britain and Ireland, for example. Britain and yeah. Ireland, uh, we still dominate the Southern Ireland's industry. Most of it's still owned by the British. Oh, really? Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Uh, but it's still the, the Irish Republic is more like the Irish Free State. That's what it still is. Uh -huh. It's still that dominated well, little yeah. clique that... It's yeah, 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 yeah. It's the same sort of deal here in Canada. You know, most of the corporations here are American. So Canada doesn't really have an independent economy. So oh, it's not really... We also have the added part of being a Dominion country. So we use you for stuff that we don't want to do because it will give us bad rep. Uh, and get you into <laughs> wars that we don't want to get involved in because it will give us bad rep. Although Australia typically takes that one because they like going gun cola. That's how we got involved in Vietnam. We literally analyzed Vietnam, saw France got punked, and was like, nah, we don't want anything to do with that. But we could send Australia. <laughs> like, we can't. Oh, yeah, they did. We're, we're bad. We're terrible people. So let's continue on Palestine. Right now, it's, you know, like on the edge of a civil war because the, uh, you know, the colonists of the, were called settlers of the Zionists who come into the West Bank and set up, you know, right near the Palestinian municipalities. They don't set up in territory that's, you know, way off somewhere. No, no, no. They go right on the edge of the uh, municipalities that are Palestinian already since thousands of years. And then they try to uh, uh, annex, you know, the territory, the surrounding villages, Palestinian villages, you know, bit by bit as well. And then when the Palestinians object, or even when they don't object, you know, the fascists from a colony like Yitzhar just outside Nablus, I've, you know, videotaped, you know, training, you know, breaking into homes and uh, occupying, you know, uh, in one house uh, after another type strategy, like they did in 1947 to 49, when they expelled the population. They trained to do that again. <laughs> and then, you know, the young ones, they go out onto the highways and they stone Palestinian cars. And then uh, they also uh, come out to Palestinian lands and uh, <coughs> try to uh, scare people away from harvesting their own crops. And then the military comes to back them up. And then they sometimes there's even one video of a of a colonist, you know, who took the uh, 
the the M16 of a soldier and started shooting himself, not himself, but shooting by himself, you know, towards Palestinians. Stuff like this is going on, you know, because it used to be that, you know, when the uh, young people were conscripted into the military, they were sent into another part of the country so they wouldn't be next to the village or the you know, municipality in which, you know, they came from. But now they cancel that and they, you know, uh, are in the same area in which, you know, they live. So if they're a settler, they work in the area, you know, that the settlement, you know, colony is, is implanted. And so, you know, if the settlers come out, you know, to do, you know, some fascist activity, you know, by chasing farmers away from harvesting, and the soldiers come out, you know, to supposedly, you know, in, impose a coexistence, you know, the soldiers, you know, are the settlers, and they're going to support the settlers, and they let the settlers do whatever they want. So there is no sort of, you know, coexistence, you know, by the military, even though they state this as their objective. They call themselves uh, the uh, Kogat. In the West Bank, you know, the military is uh, um, a commission, administrative, administrative commission for the coexistence in the West Bank, something like that. You know, and this is their stated objective, you know, and you can call them to account, you know, on it, which I tried to do, you know, once and did work for about five minutes. But then the settler came into uh, into our action of planting olive trees on the side of uh, of the mountain, you know, next to the village. This guy comes walking into the place, you know, starting filming everybody, you know, with a gun in this in his belt. And so we tried to push him out. I have a video of that, too. You know, we we're pushing him out. I was telling him off in Yiddish and everything. And then the soldiers come. And so I tell the soldiers, this guy, the soldiers are like Ethiopians, you know, like Ethiopian women soldiers, you know, who are Jewish. OK, so I tell them, you know, like, look, this guy's got a gun, you know, he's making a provocation, you know, can get rid of him. You know, we're just planting trees here. And so the soldiers, you know, moved him back, you know. And then this officer came, an Ashkenazi officer. And when he heard me talking in Yiddish, he said, you know, like, went like this, you know, come here in Hebrew, come here. So I said, sorry, I don't know Hebrew, you know, I only speak Yiddish. <laughs> so, you know, he got angry. And then when he, he uh, pointed to two of the uh, Ethiopian, you know, oh, no, one Ethiopian officer and one, you know, uh, Ashkenazi women officer, and he told them to go and get me. So then I took off down the mountain. And, you know, like I had the advantage, you know, because I was going downhill. And, you know, I didn't think they were going to shoot me. And if they did, you know, you know, so what? So, uh, but then, you know, all of a sudden there was this bush in front of me and I had to, you know, jump over the bush and I I slowed down, you know, and so the, and the two soldiers, you know, got me from either side, you know, they went around the bush instead of trying to, you know, go over it. And so they caught me and they pushed me down, you know, and I slammed into the rock, uh, you know, mountain underneath me, you know, and then I, then I refused to move after that and said, you know, like, uh, no, I want I want a Palestinian ambulance taking me away from here. And, and then they called for an Israeli ambulance to come and get me so they could keep hold of me. And then the Palestinian ambulance came first. And, and so I got away and then they they took some x-rays and found the damage, you know, and maybe it's one of the reasons why I have to go through a back operation now in a few in two weeks. That would but, add up a bit. Yeah, yeah, you know, but being slammed I mean, into the thank mountain. Thank goodness for that Palestinian uh, ambulance. So. Yeah, so they they fully understood what was going on, and they took me away so that they would save me from being arrested. But they also checked me out thoroughly, you know, and told me what was wrong. And uh, and uh, but then the next day is when I did get detained. You know, that's what happened to them the next day when we were all picked up, and the same officer came and found me there. And so they said, and he started yelling at them, you know, to get me for sure, you know, like. I think the guy only spoke Hebrew. You know, like, <laughs> anyway, finally, I got away from the military. But uh, when we go out to do a demonstration, you know, like anything can happen. But our presence as international uh, volunteers in solidarity pretty well ensures that they're not going to use live, you know, bullets, you know, other than rubber coated bullets. So. In Gaza, of course, you know, they shoot, you know, everybody with live bullets. You know, there was one day in which they killed 62 young people who were, you know, going for the border to get back, you know, to where they used to live, you know, because, you know, 70, 80 percent of the Palestinians in Gaza, you know, are refugees. Yeah. Maybe twice refugees even. And even Gaza Strip, you know, is like only half of what the Gaza Strip was before, you know. So it's, it's all, you know, big... Uh, 
big sort of, you know, like put on and people don't know about it. So, you know, the popular resistance committees, you know, combines all of the political parties. They all work together, both Fatah, Hamas, um, PFLP, the leftist, and DFLP, another leftist party. And, you know, it doesn't really matter, you know, what political party they they come from, you know, the, in the popular resistance committees, you know, everybody does the same thing. Everybody, you know, speaks to everybody else. So that's, you know, one sort of, you know, front of resistance. Um, there is no military resistance. You know, there is a Palestinian police force. And when the Israeli soldiers, you know, go beyond certain limits, Palestinian police force responds, you know, they will, you know, uh, stop the is, is Israel military. I've seen it in videos, you know, it's done. It's incredible. But they're under control by the Fatah party, which is still trying to compromise with the United States, even still, because they get, you know, like what, $136 million a year from the United States for administrative salaries, you know, in the Palestinian Authority. That's enough to buy them out. Yeah. One of those situations, the, the um, Palestinian struggle is heating up and Israel is starting to crack down and overstep its welcome in regions it's not supposed to. And once again, uh, storming Alaska Mosque at Ramadan, they did that last year. Yeah, yeah, provocation, deliberate provocation, yeah. And the uh, upcoming prime minister, who's supposed to be, you know, from center left, Lapid, has already stated that he's not going to recognize the state of Palestine. So, yeah. I feel that the Great Depression that started in October 2019 has spurred on the contradictions of empire that has pushed to a point where we're going to see the 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 war that all the skirmishes over the last 15 years have been practicing for. Yeah. Not just with Palestine, Lebanon's at risk too, Syria, um, Jordan not so much because Jordan's a British satellite state. So it seems like the Yemen conflict uh, has been uh, put into neutral because uh, they were so successful in attacking the, the uh, Saudi Arabian um, oil refineries, and with the crisis of oil production that they have right now. Uh, they uh, are so desperate, you know, to maintain oil capacity that they're willing to actually uh, negotiate a ceasefire with uh, the Houthis of Yemen in order to avoid any uh, further damage to the oil refineries in Saudi Arabia by the drones that have been sent from Yemen. Britain actually deployed troops to certain oil refineries. Yeah. Hmm. But yeah, no, that's that's good. That is that they managed to fucking scare the fucking Saudi Arabians into at least stepping back for for the for the time being. Let's hope we can yeah push things forward from there. Yeah. They need to deal with the satellite state that Saudi Arabia set up in South Yemen. Yeah, it's laughing as communists, but. I don't know many communists that work with kings. <laughs> well, anyways, I, I'm uh, putting out uh, the book that I wrote in Nablus uh, during uh, 2016, 2017, 2018. Three years to do this book. And uh, I published it in, in the first edition in English, but it was in a very expensive, you know, like edition from in England, you know, hardcover. So putting out second edition with additional material and a preface that uh, and two introductions. It's coming out in English in the United States and then uh, the translation has been done into Arabic. So it's coming out in Arabic in Jordan. And it's been even approved by the censorship. <laughs> so, oh, no way. you know, yeah. <laughs> that means you can get it on the shelves. <laughs> You know, it's sort of, you know, like a natural sort of process there. You know, you send it to the sen the publishers send anything to the censors, you know, and it's like, a, you know, just an additional step in publishing. It's just natural there. And uh, so it's going to be distributed, you know, uh, around the around uh, uh, Palestine, uh, Lebanon, Iraq, Egypt, Egypt as well is going to be distributing it. And uh, 
uh, probably Algeria and Morocco, and I'm going to try to get into Libya. But you know, Libya contact is still very difficult. So oh, that's yeah, been accomplished. What the US you know, and the UK did. Oh, Libya. I found a, an old document that I put out at the time. You know, when Libya was being attacked. You know, calling for uh, a defense committee, an ad hoc defense committee for Libya. But I didn't get any responses at the time. In all of Canada, I didn't get any response. Even in fact, you know, in the United States, I didn't get any response, you know, for defending Libya against the NATO assault. So I pretty well, you know, had to give up at How that much time. All these fucking quasi revolutionary types care about uh, actual struggle yeah, when it comes uh, to it. Yeah, yeah. You know, they use any excuse to get out of committing themselves, you know, to something that is not immediately popular. You know, these rad lips, you know, they're just populists who are trying to make a name for themselves and not really sort of, you know, trying to initiate anything, you know, that's going to make any difference. Yeah. The worst types are the ones that will try and equate Palestinians fighting back to the occupying settler force. And it's like, that. There's, you're comparing fucking oranges to footballs. Like, it, the, the, there's no similarity here between the two situations, other than the fact that the two things around, or in the case of this, the two things involve violence, but what's the reason behind the violence? Like, it's like we're having to deal with school children politics. Yes, the mm -hmm. violence has happened, but what is the meaning of the violence, Timothy? <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, a lot of sort of, you know, peace committees, you know, trying to, uh, you know, equalize, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, victims of uh, violence, you know, from both the Israeli and Palestinian side, you know, that, you know, it's the Palestinians, you know, who are uh, massacred in one village after another and expelled, you know, flee for their lives, you know, not because of any, you know, radio broadcast, you know. In fact, uh, I did an interview with a, with a grandfather, you know, from that time, and uh, the, there were no radios allowed, you know, this is a British occupation, you know, Ra radios were a subversive instrument. Yeah. And, you know, the only ra radio broadcast you could hear was from the loudspeakers from the city hall. And what was broadcasting was the BBC in Arabic. And that was it. That was all, you know. <laughs> but I thought that was what happened in communist countries. Oh, oh yeah, man. <laughs> well, and it was the BBC that was broadcasting, you know, the order, you know, to the Palestinians to, to flee and uh into you know leave your villages and you can return in two weeks after the hostilities are stopped yeah was... sure <laughs> cheeky yeah. fuckers like um, i mean yeah. we we set the whole thing up from the start with the balfour declaration we were fucking yeah. i mean we actually we we planned the balfour declaration because we signed it in 1917 we planned it out in 1910 we hadn't even started the war with the ottoman empire then we already had the whole thing in the bag before we even started that war. Sure, that was 1917, you know, that was a significant year, you know, when General Allenby took over Jerusalem, declared it to be the last crusade, as if it was permanent. You know, this was all thought about, you know, this was quite conscious. Just in, and the Zionists are acting as agents, you know, for the West now, and they're paid to do so. So in effect, they are you know, like a mercenary state, you know, that's acting on behalf of the Occidental Christian nation states. And that's all it is. It's not a Jewish homeland, as far as I can see. We may have said it's permanent when 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 we took over it in nineteen seventeen. But mm -hmm. you, you know, little did the British Empire know in ten years' time a Great Depression would happen that would be the death knell for its empire. Like that's yeah. that's the big meme. Like we reached a height in nineteen twenty four and then yeah. <laughs> it just went down yeah. from there. It happened fast, that's right. Maybe that's the same thing's happening to the US Empire at this time. I think so, and that's why I feel that the, there's going to be shindiggeries from all the empires, not just the East. Like, because the East are going to stop getting big for their boots because they can. The US can't do shit. Uh, yeah. That's why the US is on the fence about war with Russia. If it was 10 years ago, the US would already be in Ukraine with the boys and fucking. Uh, mm. the, the the tan fucking uniforms, but yeah. the fucking now they're in a situation where they can't do that. Uh, well, they can, but they they need to be really considerate about it because if they lose this war, it's not going to be good for them. Um, mm. 
the UK doesn't need to jump straight in. They just need everyone to think that they're going to jump straight in if they're the ones playing this this situation. And we know that France and Germany aren't playing this situation because they're the most reliant on Russian oil. US is heavily reliant on Russian oil. I think um, almost mm. half of American oil is reliant on Russian oil from like 30 or 40%. Europe. No, Europe is like 80%. America's like 30, 40. Europe's ridiculous. Like Europe relies stupidly. Oh, I think it's in the winter it's 80%, but yeah. it varies. But nonetheless, um, yeah. Germany and France they're mm. hella reliant on Russian oil more than they're reliant on U.S. oil. Um, yes. And they're reliant on uh, Russian gas as well, you know, to generate electricity. Yeah. So, you know, like cities at stake as well. <laughs> Imagine Europe, you know, being like Gaza, four hours of electricity a day. <laughs> and um, the British, we rely on 20% of Russian oil and gas for our energy needs. Really? <laughs> so we don't really get affected too much by it. But still, 20%. We get you know, affected like... by the American stock market situation regarding it because our oil prices are tied to their petrodollar bollocks. So everyone mm. suffers anyway. Mm. But we're not like we're not like the EU where you know 80% of our gas needs in the winter come from Russia and and then, then You've got the mass amount of petroleum that they're going to get from there. Um, uh -huh. Germany just literally finished Nord Stream 2 and then had to turn around and say, okay, we're not letting anything go through this. <laughs> it's, oh, for fuck's sake. it's a comedy of errors. Incredible. Um, yeah. But that's the crisis. But the um, it's this crisis in Europe that is no different to the same bullshit that we've seen in Europe for the last... God knows what, two thousand years now. I mean, go all the way back to the Romans, and they were doing the same shit, fucking mm -hmm. squabbling with what you what wasn't Russia at the time; it was somewhere else. But the Romans had their own little problem up in the east. Um, mm -hmm. the, the Eastern Westernism is is defunct nonsense, in my opinion. I think it's something that just comes from, uh the cold war making a different situation or well the well the, the world war one making a different situation um so that you had this weird um although somewhat poor attempt at um uh, no worries mlm i'll catch you in a bit respect comment well, until uh, he can't watch. This needs to until Nasserism takes hold again, and there's a pan Arabist federation, the whole Western Orient there, you know, all the Arab countries are going to be picked off, you know, one after the other by the United States. Absolutely. The only hope they have is, you know, for a pan Arabist federation, not one state, as it was, you know, initially sort of implemented by Nasser, but, you know, a federation of uh, autonomous societies. That would work. But not with the regimes that are in place now. No, it's hopeless. But you know, the Saudi Arabia is going to suffer. Oh yeah, they 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 stabbed their own people in the back to get to get put on thrones that don't exist. They were created by the British Crown. That's yeah. the only reason there's ever been a king of Saudi Arabia. Yeah, Jordan too. He, he was originally imported from Saudi Arabia, the Husseini clan. Well, let's see now. Palestine, what can happen? You know, the ICC, International Criminal Court, was asked to investigate, you know, human rights violations, you know, both in Palestine and in Israel, okay, which they were willing to do, but they're not being allowed in, you know, by Israel. So, you know, that's not going to go very far. Now, in terms of the recognition of Palestine as a state by the United Nations uh, General Assembly, yeah, but it could be vetoed, you know, by Security Council. But then it would have to be overturned by a two-thirds majority of the General Assembly, which can overturn a veto in the Security Council. It's never been done, but there is a provision for that. That's the only hope for the United Nations. And for the recognition of Palestine, I think it could be done. But sort of depends on Europe. 
France is trying to play a role of uh, negotiating between the parties, you know, involved, you know, but they're not getting very far because they don't want to go very far. Yeah. So it's still stale, stalemate, you know, still stalled. Everything's in an impasse. Negotiations, you know, between uh, Israel and the Palestinian Authority or the PLO, is, it's not going to happen because the Israelis don't want it to happen. Not the Israelis, I should say the Israel, Israel's government. You know, there's a conflation made, you know, of the term Israeli and Israel's government. And uh, I wanted to make that distinction there because Israelis uh, refers to the population, it's a demographic term. And of course, 20% or more of the Israeli population are Palestinians. Then another couple of percentage points of Druze, and then another couple of percentage points of Bedouins, as well as another nationality. And then you have, you know, the Jewish Israelis, which are divided up into various nationalities as well, you know. The Ashkenazim, you know, are a minority. Ashkenazim, you know, who are the leaders, you know, who control everything, and you know, who are the, uh, you know, the national bourgeoisie, you know, they are a minority of the actual Jewish population, which is 50%, you know, Mizrahim which are Jewish Arabs from Arab countries who used to speak Arab, Arabic, 50%. Then there's, you know, like another 20, 25% who are from Russia, you know, 2 million Russian Jewish, who are also Ukrainian, you know, divided up into Ukrainians and Russians. And then that leaves, you know, Ashkenazim afterwards, you know, like, and so there's all these, you know, various nationalities, even within the Israeli Jewish, you know, nation, so to speak, you know, in sociological term. That's why I, I refer to the Hebrew nation, because, you know, they they all speak Hebrew, so that, you know, they have their own sort of, you know, identity, you know, that they've built up over the years. And then, you know, they can figure it out for themselves internally, you know, with their own constituent assembly. Palestinians as well will have their constituent assembly. Then they will have a federal council. And, uh, and then gradually the, uh, you know, the refugees can return, you know, because, you know, if... Uh, you have a federation, you don't have a state so that, you know, people can live anywhere and vote for their own governments. They don't have to sort of be within the frontiers of a given state apparatus. That's sort of abolished. It's obsolete. So then the refugees can come back, you know, to their villages, which are still there, rebuild them, vote for the Palestinian election. And then the Israelis can have their own government with their own majority. You know, they don't have to, you know, like make a big fuss over, you know, how many Palestinians there are because actually they're a minority already. And also, Jewish Israelis are a minority of the Jewish people. There's more Jewish Americans than there are Jewish Israelis. You know, so how do they get off, you know, like speaking for the Jewish people as a whole? I don't know. And, you, know you know, like, you know, since he's speaking for all the Jewish people in the world, you know, like, really? Then how come I didn't get a vote? <laughs> how come the majority of the Jewish people didn't get a vote for him? <laughs> or anybody else? The, the the Jewish nation state that was hand given by God. Do you know how we know? Because this atheist told us so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's all the bastard. And if you actually go into the Torah, you know, into the the original five books of Moses, that's not what's written there. No, it's a whole other story. Uh, I mean... Get into that. They like to hide behind the Torah, but they do not like to read the Torah. Yeah. So where do they get their idea of what the Torah says? From the Protestants. <laughs> A reliable the source, Protestant. I'm sure. It's not like there's yeah, the centuries of anti-Semitism that comes from Protestantism. Land, you know, they belong there. They don't belong in the Christian countries. No way, you know. <laughs> they belong over there, you know, and only over there, and that's it. You know. I mean, Protestants are seen as bastards by Christian standards. I can't imagine what they're like by Jewish standards. <laughs> yeah, well, especially you know, I went through the Protestant. Cool. I went through the Protestant educational system. You know, I, I was, I was there. They tried to do their trip on me. You know, they had a scene: "God save the Queen" every morning. Sing it now. <laughs> Shall we sing God Save the Queen? <laughs> I don't even know the words, you know. <laughs> God kill the I can't say that on here. <laughs> oh, and then after God Save the Queen, 
they had the Lord's Prayer going, you know, like I had to sort of, you know, stand up, but I didn't bow my head. And they didn't know it, you know, because they're all their eyes were closed, you know, so I could get away with that. That's but, uh, I like to do it. Um, yeah, well, what a trip. Oh, they used to make us sing hymns back in fucking primary school. Oh, really? Oh, yes. Wow. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know how to do it anymore, but I used to know how to sing Our God's a Great Big God in Portuguese. Yes, they, <laughs> they made us learn Portuguese. I didn't know geese spoke porch, but. Uh, well, so Palestine, huh? It really depends. The whole fate of Palestine depends upon the course of the uh, surrounding Arab states and what happens there. Everything, and they and Iran. But Iran is not playing a direct role in uh, all this. You know, like, you know, Hamas is being, the Hamas government, you know, which was elected in 2006 or, yeah, 2006 or 2016. 2006, I think it was. The Hamas government was elected. They're only financed, you know, by Qatar and Al Jazeera. You know, that's where they get their funding from, you know, because they don't get any, any of the funding, you know, that's directed to the um, Fatah government of the Palestine Authority. There they get their money from the United States and from taxation, you know, that's held or, you know, delivered you know, by Israel, you know, and it's collected at the border entry point, you know, for sales tax, that sort of thing. So it's like, you know, two governments, two separate governments, two separately financed governments. Now, if there were to be a Palestinian election, boy, that should really set things off. Then, you know, Hamas would, you know, have at least equal, you know, support, you know, to Fatah and perhaps more. But what they should actually do, I think, you know, is form a coalition government, you know, each, you know, party trying to take over the government exclusively, you know, and keeping the others, you know, like out of power is a failing strategy for the Palestinians as a whole. And the Palestinians know it. Yeah, so there could be that development, you know, that could be a big breakthrough, you know, a Palestinian election with a coalition government. Then, you know, they could start to force Israel, you know, to uh, get down to negotiate things, you know, because, uh, you know, uh, Hamas won't let uh, Israel get away with, you know, what they've been able to do with, uh, you know, Fatah. Yeah, I so, think that wouldn't be a bad idea at all. Um I, especially pressuring and the, the 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 necessity of support from neighboring countries, which is getting more increasingly difficult because Iraq has just been invaded by Turkey. Yeah. So it depends on the revolution in Egypt. You know, the Hezbollah in Lebanon is pretty secure. Jordan, you know, like is is a dead end right now. But Egypt, you know, if Egypt, you know, had a revolution got rid of the military control, they finally, you know, had to were forced, you know, to allow an election to take place again. And if it was, you know, anything close to what Nasser was before, you know, that would be a breakthrough for Gaza, for sure, you know, because right now Gaza is under siege, you know, not only from Israel, but from Egypt as well. <laughs> the exit, you know, at Rafah into Egypt is closed most of the time. It's, you know, they're, they're confronting not only Israel, you know, but all the reactionary Arab regimes, you know, at the same time. You know, and the Palestinians, you know, cannot cope. Well, they've been under this, they've been under pressure of this for, for well, for a hundred years from the from the Western powers, but they had to deal mm. with this with the Ottomans for fucking centuries as well. The Ottomans weren't, weren't much kinder to the Arab people. Um, yeah. The Arabs, the Assyrians, the Azerbaijani, they got the, the shit end of the stick. And then when the West ever got their reaches in that region, they, they fuck shit up. Um, yeah. Or in the lesser case with the East, you had Stalin decide to make up fucking, um, oh, sorry, Armenia. Sorry, that's what I meant to say instead of Azerbaijan earlier. And then Stalin decided to make up Azerbaijan because... Mm -hmm. That's my colleague, the uh, cook at the uh, cultural center, calling me. That's all right. If you need to take this, you can get. Uh... But I can call her back afterwards. Oh, that's all right. Then. But uh, the last thing to talk about is Libya. You know, because Libya can be having a presidential election, and the most favored candidate 
even though he has no resources, no party, no apparatus, no nothing except for uh, for uh, Dr. Ibrahim uh, Yusuf, I think his name is. Yes, I heard him speaking on the RT, saying that he's going to be a presidential candidate, you know, the son of Gaddafi. And his full name is uh, uh, Saith al-Islam al-Qaddafi. Oh. And, uh, he, you know, he's uh, in a secure place now. He was arrested, detained, you know, by some tribe or other, but they released him finally. And uh, I don't know if uh, how he keeps the security going, you know, but he's there in Libya. But the election is not taking place yet, you know, because this the CIA previously funded, you know, this uh, General Haftar, who wasn't even a general, you know, he just sort of proclaimed himself to be a general and sent himself up and they bought himself a lot of equipment and uniforms. <clears throat> they control the eastern part of the country around the, the center of Benghazi, the city there. So Benghazi was, you know, always the stronghold of the um, populist, you know, right wing Islamists, Islamists, you know, forces, which were in opposition to Gaddafi before. And Gaddafi, you know, was always in conflict with him and it was supposedly to save them from, you know, a genocide that, you know, the NATO came in. But, you know, there was no such genocide that was practiced, you know, despite some verbiage on the part of Gaddafi, unfortunately. <clears throat> so. If finally, you know, the UN sponsored government in Tripoli can get the election going. Well, then, you know, we may see, you know, this uh, Gaddafi, you know, as being president of Libya again. And, you know, with enough popular support, you know, they could move things forward and stop Haftar from taking over the place. But the problem is Haftar is supported by Egypt. So again, Egypt is the crucial, you know, uh, turning point there again. Because if Egypt changes and has a you know, revolution or an election, you know, that brings in, you know, <clears throat> some sort of, you know, re, you know, government, you know, that is moving things along, they're not going to be supporting, you know, the CIA, you know, General Haftar anymore. So then he'll fall and then Libya will be able to become independent again from NATO. So then that would be Egypt and Libya together. And then that would, you know, push you know, Algeria uh, out of its, you know, stasis, you know, military control. Tunisia as well, uh, under the dictatorship of the guy who proclaimed himself, you know, to be whatever, the king. So in all those countries, you know, they'd be like dominoes, you know, going, you know, right across the whole Maghreb and northern Africa. And that would hit Morocco pretty hard too both from the north and the south with Polisario, so the kingdom, you know, in Morocco could follow as well. You know, so there could be this whole sort of, you know, string of events that have taken place, you know, in the immediate future. It all depends I upon Egypt. I find that it's quite likely as well. So imperialism is on the precipice of another decolonization movement across the globe. That happens every, de every Great Depression. Every Great Depression that's ever happened in the history of capitalism has spurred on greater yeah. decolonization i mean yeah. the really big key ones is things like world war one and world war two world war one mm -hmm. you saw the irish socialist republic of 1916 you saw the soviet union 1917 you saw a mass yeah. decolonization movement in the middle east against the ottoman empire you saw uh -huh. uh, a rise in struggles in africa you saw haiti try and rise up again against the americans you saw the um there was a, a an upsurge in um, African struggle against white oppression in America as well, uh, which mm. actually ended up leading to uh, the government encouraging people to go and massacre black people and then covering for it, saying that it was Bolsheviks that were being killed, mm. um, the Red Summer Massacres. But nonetheless, mm. then World War Two had... All, uh, a third of the world go through a decolonization, uh, 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 a successful decolonization platform. Uh, well, until the Soviet Union decided to do the social imperialism, but that gets a bit too complicated. Mm. Yes. Yeah. We're going to see that again, and it's going to be bigger, bigger than ever. Yeah. And international as well, not just in one sector of the world. It's going to be international everywhere, all at the same time. Yeah. If it's going to start anywhere, it would likely be Africa or the Middle East, in my opinion. So it's the hottest place in the world for conflict, crisis, and uh, uh, depraved material conditions caused by extreme amounts of imperialist plundering. 
we take as much mm. resources as we can from these regions. Mm. Yeah. Well, China is trying to make its profit there as well, even though they're helping in development, you know, to uh, an unprecedented extent. But still, it's, you know, I think private corporations from China that are nonetheless owned 49 percent, you know, by the Chinese bourgeoisie. But still, it's uh, the bourgeoisie that is controlling. So, so mixed know, bag of things happen. Take with China, though. Yeah, China's foreign policy platform was actually an idea that was already come up with decades before. A man oh. came up with a similar idea for British foreign policy, and his name's Oswald Mosley. Oh, yeah. British mm -hmm. Union of Fascists. Uh -huh. He said Britain should develop the infrastructure of the nations at bombs instead of bombing them. And then uh. you stop immigrants from swarming over these countries. <laughs> and we all know that he's smarter than that. He knows that he wants to imperialize these nations. It's it's because if you develop them, you can work them in them countries more rather than drain these people from these nations. Why don't we make the infrastructure there that we can work them like slaves? Yeah, and then create a local domestic market that buys the goods that are being, you know, manufactured by the foreign corporations as subsidy subsidiaries, like in Canada. Same thing, yeah. And trying, you know, like Canada means to counter revolution as well. Yeah, you know what the American automobile companies did, you know, in NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement, they planted factories in Canada to create jobs in Canada. Okay, so this was the government strategy to make jobs in Canada. And the jobs, you know, were highly paid jobs, you know, let's say about $35 an hour at the time. Jesus While, Christ. you know, American workers were making like $55 an hour at the American auto plants, you know, when Detroit was going. And then, you know, the cars that were being made in Canada were being sold to Canadians at a higher price than they were being imported to the United States and being sold in the United States for a lesser price than they were being sold for in Canada. <laughs> so Canada, the Canadians were getting ripped off twice. That you know, by having, you know, like American bad. factories, you know, there with their technology. And, you know, nobody likes noticed this, <laughs> except for a few political economists. And we formed a, a school of research, you know, at York University, where I was teaching for a while. That was sort of pretty interesting. And there was a movement, you know, left, you know, nationalist so-called movement, you know, like in the Social Democratic Party called the Waffle, because they weren't radical enough and everybody knew it, you know, so they called it the Waffle because they were waffling. But it uh, lasted for a while. But the whole sort of, you know, independence movement from the United States and from Britain, you know, hasn't sort of, you know, continued on. That's what's lacking in Canada. Okay, Anglo -Canada I think if anything, is America has just pushed Canada back into Britain's pocket. I think Britain uh -huh. want to make an economic union between its main dominions, Canada, Australia, New Zealand and the UK is uh -huh. probably its next prospect. Well, they've got the financial power to do it. London is the financial capital of the world. Yeah. Even if, you know, some of uh, this never really ever changed. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of the things that's missed, everyone goes on about this like dead British Empire, and it's like, no, they just, they, they didn't even, what, what I don't get with it is they did neocolonialism the least hidden. Like they call it the British Commonwealth. They have specific yeah. dominion status countries. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, places it's... that literally still bear the Union Jack uh, yeah. that isn't Britain, and it's like uh, a... yeah, like Ontario and British Columbia, British Columbia and, and province in Canada. Yeah, you know, like Jack uh, is still there, the and, and the way, you know, still called, belongs to and us. Whose dominion was Canada? Yeah. Canada was a dominion of the Queen. Yes, the Queen of Canada is still in existence. We're also, you know, she's also the head of the Anglican Church. So, we, you know, we have a theocratic, you know, state imposed by Britain upon Canada and Australia and probably Jamaica still, you know, oh, even though left, start, I think. They, oh, yeah. But uh, to, but the others, you know, like are, are still, you know, in the Commonwealth, like Trinidad, Tobago. We've also got them two old channel islands that. Uh, yeah, yeah. We don't give a but, shit you know, about. There was a uh, there was once a um, a movement, you know, for a federation of the uh, 
of the former Commonwealth, you know, uh, islands of the Caribbean. They were supposed to make a federation out of it, you know, but it fell apart. Uh, according to what I was reading when I was studying uh, CLR James recently for the work that I was doing on the manual. But uh, there's a lot, there's a lot there to do, uh, to settle. And I think we're doing it. So I'm really glad to be on this uh, stream with you. Oh, and uh, we'll have to continue, uh, you know, after I get out of the hospital. Oh yeah, I mean, when I, I I I'll be going to the hospital as well myself in a few days' time. So, when, when, oh yeah, when, 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 you'll probably you'll I I I can't even English. <laughs> when we've both dealt with them things, we'll have to convene again and and get talking more about these issues going on, and also have more general conversation streams as well. Because me and you could bat it on for hours. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. Okay, so uh, I'll, t I'll, I'll teach you some Yiddish, you know, Yiddish is my first language actually, not English. So, you know, when we say uh, never again in English, you know, in Yiddish uh, it's pronounced like this, Kaimul nicht noch einmal. Yeah, sort of, you know, it sounds more like communist, you know, like let's be, you know, like or something. <laughs> it's like a pirate communist. <laughs> but, uh, but the Kaimelnish means, you know, you know, never again, you know, like it's a, a really emphatic, you know, way of saying it, you know, never again, you know, no way, no way, no how, that kind of thing. Uh, and uh, Nochamol is, uh, <clears throat> you know, again, Nochamol. So it's Kaimelnish uh, Nochamol, you know, I could really get the chance to speak Yiddish, so I wanted to take the opportunity to record that. Well, so there we go. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I've always wanted so, to learn another language properly, but I can I can get willkommen and scheiße, and that's about as far as I can go. <laughs> I know how to shit, and I know how to say welcome. <laughs> well, I, I know a bit of French, and I know a, a song chorus in Spanish, but that's about it. Well, you're European. That's the way it should be. You know, East Europeans, like my parents, they spoke five languages. You know, for, you know, Americans and English Canadians here, you know, to think that everyone else in the world should speak English and they don't have to learn any other language, you know, like, oh, that's so incredible. You know, I really wanted to learn Russian, so I know how to read in Russian, but I can't, I don't know any Russian words. <laughs> uh -oh. I, uh -oh. I know what the symbols mean, but I don't know, don't know any further See than that. But it's because I Same also know me. a bit of Greek symbols, so it was a little easier to flip between the two. Oh, really? I, I had to uh, go through a British uh, classical uh, high school education, so they taught me Latin, you know, uh, obligatory Latin. for four years. Greek was optional, so I didn't go for that, you know, but uh, I was in the school orchestra playing lead second violinist. It took up so much of my time, you know, like I should have been, you know, doing my homework <laughs> there's actually a study that was found that playing instruments stimulates the part of the brain that involves intellectual engagement so you, you're yeah. still teaching yourself somewhat um but it's sort of um with latin i i, I had someone who knew latin because i don't really know any once tell me that it's kaiser not caesar so i always i always like to to uh I don't hold it over people in my class, but when I'm dealing with aristocrats who like act like they're really smart because they know somewhat about Roman history, and then they say Caesar, hey, I just hey. come in uh, with with a, with a poor accent and just come in and go, you know, it's it's Kaiser, not Caesar, you know. <laughs> <I don't> think, <laughs> I've, I've even had someone thought I was getting confused with the German word Kaiser, and I'm like, where do you think the German word comes from? <laughs> okay, <bro. laughs> of course. Germany didn't have any king at that time. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so... So, I think that, uh, you know, things are, are moving. And when things are moving, then, uh, you know, our expectations can be uh, favorable. It's when things are stagnant that, you know, then the Nazis take over. 
So as, as long as there's motion and there's uh, movements, you know, people, you know, moving out, you know, to do something at least, then there's really, you know, uh, a conclusion that is to be expected, you know, because there's a logical course of events, you know, to follow through on this coming depression. And uh, I think we're ready for it. I, so I feel the third world will rise up and struggle. We saw communists, socialists and, all, and anti-imperialists armed to the teeth. In the last few mm. years, the right mm. and the left will both rise in these contradictions, but the dialectic is accelerating, and let's hope that when it stops, it lands in our favor. Yes, I agree with you. I agree with your third worldism as well. I think the third world is the vanguard of the revolution. In the first world, there's a polarization in both left and right, you know, and it's not, you know, sure, you know, which is going to be uh, dominant in the outcome. And but the third the people the and the, the supposed factor. left who don't agree with us as well, they try and sabotage any of the points we try and bring forward for yeah. struggle to. Oh, yes, I've been boycotted by leftists, for sure. Yeah, I was expelled both from the Social Democratic Party in Canada and Ontario in 1970, and I was expelled, you know, from the uh, Quebec Solidaire Party here in Quebec, even, you know, even though they have, you know, you know, communists in there, even, you know, a, a leader from the former... Uh, Iranian Communist Party, which has turned reactionary, I understand. Ah, everything is so mis mixed up. <laughs> it's the way but, that uh, they like to isolate people who criticize the means of which they get their class benefits from. They like the imperialist system, it benefits them. Yeah, yeah, they got, you know, like a MP salary and all this. And so, you know, they were thinking that they are on top of the world, you know. But... Uh, I think what we're creating here with our media is a, a is a breakthrough into uh, you know uh, the development of consciousness, which is otherwise you know monopolized you know by one current or another, and that is no longer possible because the internet is free. The internet wasn't even patented by its inventor. Anybody can get into it. They cannot stop us. And I just got a letter of apology from Twitter for being suspended. <laughs> Well, they want my phone number for my suspended account, so I, I every time I have to keep making a new account, <laughs> they're not getting my fucking phone number. <laughs> uh, uh, I just I threw my credentials, my academic qualifications at them, and they sent me a letter of apology oh, wow. because I could sue them, you know, for denial of academic freedom. You know, I, I've got my qualification. You know, like <laughs> I, I, I would just do some too. poor bimmy guys so they don't give a fuck about who I am. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, you know, if they try to pull anything like that, you know, I'm there, you know, to back you up. Like I did backed up Jason, you know, Unru, you know, when YouTube tried to, uh, you know, uh, censor some of his videos, you know, they just popped up on my channel for some reason or another. You know? <laughs> I remember that. That was wicked. That was. Yeah, never happened again. <laughs> you became Good. Jason Unru for a little bit and then you just stopped. It wasn't, oh, it yeah. wasn't no working. Problem. The relationship yeah. just didn't work out. Yeah. Well. Okay, so we better stop now before people fall asleep. <laughs> the, the most the person who falls asleep the most on these streams always ends up being me anyway. <laughs> yeah. I I what's it? Uh, some there's been some streams where I've fallen asleep after three hours and the stream's gone on for seven hours and I've just been asleep for four <laughs> hours on stream. <laughs> really? wow. Wow. But it's really great to create a space like this, you know, where we are who we are and we and we have no sort of buddy, nobody around, you know, telling us to can't that we can't be, you know, like who we are. That's what I, I love. I'm very, about I'm very sort of hats off like that. I don't like the professional uh, atmosphere, not because it's not in a productive one because of course it's a productive one but it's cold like it, it's very night and day and i like this more sort of uh hodgepodge uh have a cup of tea style atmosphere although i'd have a cup of tea but my cup's being bleached in the other room it's mm. stained to fuck with tea <laughs> <laughs> you know, no no this dialogue this freeform dialogue you know actually creates is very creative you know it creates new New ideas, you know, which pop up out of the uh, dialectic, you know, between two uh, two partners. Yes, absolutely. We've got very yeah. different sort of dialectics going on for a lot of different angles: cultural background, age group background, um, yeah. 
a political philosophies aren't so oppor opposite. Bondism and third worldism share a lot of agreements on a lot of different things. So, mm. but we we differentiate on a on a political cultural basis more than anything. Uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. So it, in terms of our experience and what we we have uh, been able to to work at and what is available for us to work at, you know, differs, you know, from one site to another as well. So, but this yeah. is actually what Stalin would call the correct application of card rays in a political discussion, the combination yeah. of the young and the old operating together. Although fucking my disability makes me feel like I'm in my sixties. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have to get ourselves fixed up and then we can continue on. Because uh, I think that the times are waiting for us. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, well, it was um, it was great engaging with you, uh, with you, comrade. Um, what's it? I'll say that long live the Palestinian people's struggle for their freedom. They've non-stop stood and stood and stood for their struggle every year. I mean, the Land Day thing that was being shown for an example, every year on Land Day, ever mm. since their land was taken from them, they have protested every single every single year for every single important Muslim holiday that represents freedom, not just the ones centered around that have come from modern times. They have had holidays that celebrate freedom for centuries, and every mm. time they will come out and protest. So long live mm -hmm. the Palestinian struggles. Struggle never doesn't die. It only has setbacks. One well, of my favorite Kwame Ture quotes to close on. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Okay.